Hello, the internet. Why do we need systems biology to help science slow or stop aging? That would be the most profound medical breakthrough since antibiotics, so it's worth knowing a little about. I spent the last month learning about the new field of systems biology and how it might relate to aging research, so let me tell you how that went in the simplest way I can. What even is systems biology? Well, imagine we have a little miniature world like this terrarium. We can break that down. It has grass and sheep that eat the grass and wolves that eat the sheep. And we can study those parts. How much grass do the sheep need to eat to survive? And how many sheep do the wolves need to eat to survive? Most biology has been about breaking things down to understand the ecosystem, learn about the creatures, to understand the creatures, look at the organs, to understand the organs, look at the cells, to understand the cells, look at the individual biochemicals. Systems biology is concerned with zooming back out and putting all of that together. The terrarium is an analogy for our body. When everything is steady, that's like homeostasis and health. There's just enough grass for all the sheep, just enough sheep for all the wolves to eat. Everything is in balance. And as the system drifts from this stable, resilient state into disorder and fragility, we call that aging. Our goal is to understand how systems like this terrarium or our own bodies stay balanced and healthy. And to do that, we need to look at the whole system, not just the way that sheep or grass or wolves behave on their own. If we can really understand how these systems behave, we can keep them from falling apart. I'm Dr. Peter Allen, bioanalytical chemist and host of this Science Curious channel and this series of videos about aging. I am trying to sort out how to explain systems biology in a way that's relevant to aging and also comprehensible. And that turns out to be really hard. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to look for existing explanations of how systems biology works. I'm going to read a paper on systems biology and aging, and also a book on systems biology, and sort of look for relevant aging passages. So first I read this perspective piece by Cohen. The conclusion is a hypothesis. Aging is a change in an emergent property of a complex system. So having read Voigt, there are two definitions that I found pretty useful. Definition one is the computational systems biology as a whole is the use of computers and big data to simulate biological systems. And that gives us insights into what those systems do in real time that are non-obvious from a look at the properties of the parts. That's super useful. Experimental systems biology is the measurement of all the data that goes into those computational systems and validates them and says, yeah, this, this does predict real behavior, not just stuff we're making up. And experimental systems biology tends to come from omics level technology. So genomics, metabolomics, proteomics, experiments that measure all of the genome, proteome, metabolome, all at once. So that's a pretty good feel for what the field is, but how does that help us with aging? So that's a harder question. We might need to turn to a more specific source for that. I mean, my hypothesis at this point is that aging is the emergent property of a whole bunch of interrelated systems, or maybe I should say that youthful vitality is an emergent property of all of these systems when they're working well, and aging is the slow breakdown of these systems because, because, why? Why do they break down? And that's the question that really, I think only systems biology is going to be able to answer. Let's go back to that terrarium model. The populations of the creatures in a terrarium start off stable, or at least there are conditions where they could be stable. There's just enough grass for the sheep and just enough wolves to keep the sheep from growing further. This balance is like, no, no, stop that, stop that. That's how we get copyright trouble. This isn't mysticism, this is math. Each of these boxes represent numbers, a number of sheep, a number of wolves, an amount of grass. The arrows indicate what's consumed to produce what other thing. Within limits, like the soil could remain consistent in this model. We don't need to worry about how much soil is or its health. The lotka volterra mathematical model is a two equation version. These equations let us graph the population of wolves and sheep over time. And under some conditions, the equations predict a steady state with fairly consistent populations. And that's like health of this little model ecology. But even this toy system can produce swings between overpopulation and near extinction until it breaks down completely. So let's look at this lotka volterra model in a more visual way. This Walensky Net Logo program is an agent-based model. It's a 
different kind of mathematical system, but I think it gets the point across really well. It's not based on differential equations, it's like a zero player video game where there are lots of little video game sheep and little video game wolves and tufts of grass, and they behave according to rules that are carefully defined to perform the simulation of the Lotka Volterra population dynamics. The agent bait simulation starts off with a bunch of sheep and wolves. The green color is the amount of grass. This is a wolf, this is a sheep. Down on the lower left, you can see a graph of the different populations as they change over time. So let's speed things up. The obvious thing is the waves of green as the grass gets overpopulated. Then the sheep population explodes and consumes all the grass. The green color fades. The wolf population booms after the sheep and resets the whole thing in a sort of cycle over and over. At some point, naively, we might think the grass population is too low. Let's just turn up the grass growth rate and that'll make everything better. But when we speed it up again, we see this big spike of grass followed by sheep and then wolves and then collapse. The wolves go extinct. It's not obvious why adding more grass would make the wolves go extinct, but this systems level model helps us understand that consequence. The populations got too big and then it broke. This could happen in the real world too. In Canada, lynx eat the rabbit. Over decades, we can see a boom and bust cycle where rabbits multiply and are plentiful, and then the lynx eat all they want, but then the lynx get overpopulated and they eat all the rabbits and the rabbit population gets low and there's not enough to eat so the lynx population declines again, and then the rabbits multiply over and over again. So I read Voigt's textbook on a short introduction to systems biology, and it's a great book, very readable, a uh, good introduction to the subject, and they, the book goes over a bunch of really concrete examples, like metabolic engineering. How do you make a creature that will make a whole bunch of ethanol from a bunch of waste? We like ethanol, useful for burning as fuel, and bugs know how to make it, so let's make the bugs make more of it without killing the bugs. That's great. That's really interesting. Um, it also has a whole lot of differential equations. I think I'll talk about that. And I was trying to come up with a really visual example of what this means to be a dynamic system, why modeling such a system is important, and then how we can both view that and then why it matters to aging. And it turns out that Professor Voigt has actually published on using dynamic systems biology modeling approaches in inflammation, which is super re relevant to aging. Inflammaging, they call it. So I'm on the right track, but I don't really have a great example of a visual systems biology example. So I've got two that he doesn't talk about, but that I think are interesting. One is the belusov zabotinsky reaction, and the other is the lotkin volterra population dynamics. And, and these are both... I mean, one is a ecology and the other is a chemical reaction system, but both are relevant to the kind of modeling that he talks about. Differential equation-based numerical simulation. So I'm going to go with those and we'll see if they make sense. We can use this same mathematical approach to model molecular systems as well. Molecular biological systems, but also chemical systems. This is the belosov zabotinsky reaction. It looks almost alive, but it's just chemistry just really interesting chemistry. It's a really interesting challenge for computational simulation. We know exactly what goes into the reaction. There's no mysteries like there might be in biology. Even so, its behavior is really hard to predict. Now, overall, it's a really simple reaction. Cerium catalyzes bromate and malonic acid to react and form some products. But if you look at the net reaction, you get no hints of the oscillating system hidden inside. Along the way to those products, the reaction produces intermediates. We'll label them X, Y, and Z. That's bromous acid, bromide ions, and cerium 4+. That's the bright yellow compound that produces most of the color change. And these intermediates consume each other and produce the products. If we stir the reaction, we see these waves occurring in time. We can graph those as how much light gets absorbed over time. Researchers are still adding to this list as they examine the reaction more closely. One published model has 80 reactions and 26 different intermediates. But let's stick with this simpler system published by Bajikina. The oscillations of cerium-4 plus concentration happen because cerium-4 is produced exponentially with bromous acid. 
but then cerium-4 plus is reduced back to cerium-3 plus, and that makes bromide, and that consumes all the bromous acid, and the reaction shuts down. The experimental result we can see on the left, the cerium-4 plus blowing up and then settling down again, matches Z in this simulation on the right. And because we have a simulation of everything in the system, we get to know what the bromous acid and bromide are doing, even though those are invisible to the eye. We can infer their behavior. Now, this is more like systems chemistry than systems biology, but I think it serves to show how computation and experiment go together to reveal the invisible and predict the possible. Ultimately, it's just bromate and malonic acid reacting for the products, but now we've seen that there's a whole system hidden inside that computation can help us reveal. Like, animal life is just the oxidation of food in the presence of oxygen, but that doesn't really capture the emergent properties that we're interested in. You know, like Marvel movies and swimming. If we want to understand the system, we need a system-level model. And biology is way more complex than something simple like this BZ reaction. This is just one part of energy metabolism. That's the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle is one little part of the metabolome of E. coli. And that's just one relatively simple cell. Our bodies have lots of different kinds of cells. So if we want to integrate all of the complexity of human biology, we're going to need a really advanced computer simulation. So here's a 2021 paper that spells out the next steps in applying this approach to aging. Omics level experiments like genomics, the measurement of the genome, all the DNA in the cell, or proteomics, the measure of all the protein in the cell, those produce tons of experimental data. We can integrate that experimental data into clever simulations. And if we understand the results of those simulations, we can do all kinds of wonderful things. We can predict biomarkers and we can respond to those with specifically tailored nutritional and drug-based interventions. So let's come back to that Cohen diagram. These reaction diagrams, now we have a feeling for what those represent. They represent the kind of reaction dynamics that I've shown. They represent a differential equation or agent-based model that we can build. We can look at these parts and consider how they relate to our analogy. Out in the world, we encounter germs. Our body has an inflammatory response as part of the immune system. If all goes well, the germs are eliminated and returned to stable state. But now we can start to think of this in a more aging context. We know that the model of sheep and wolves can be stable or it can get out of control. Likewise, inflammation, when it's regulated and works well, produces health. But sterile inflammation or inflammaging is a thing. As people get old, their inflammatory system tends to get a little bit dysregulated. Understanding that at a systems level is what we need in order to intervene. Just turning the knob to try to turn up or down the inflammatory response is probably not a good idea. Just like turning up or down the grass in our toy model of the Lockwood Volterra dynamic produced wild and unpredictable results. Are you interested in aging biology? Do you have a question you'd like to see answered? Drop me a link in the comments or a question or send me an email or even a voicemail. There's a temporary email address and a phone number in the description and pinned comment. So get in touch. Maybe I can use your question or comment in a future video. I will leave you anonymous unless you request otherwise. If you like this video, you can see my last video where I started in on this systems biology journey and the motivation from the Cohen paper from 2016, which I think really helped me out on this path. So thanks for watching and we will see you next time.